Hey, let's welcome in our first guest of the program today, Jim Klein. And uh, Jim wears many hats. It's great to have you on as a guest in that hat today here, Jimbo. Thank you very much. I actually, I thought it was Panama Canal Day. I missed the uh, the apostrophe memo. <laughs> actually, today? I think it, it, I think it actually is. Today in history. I actually listened yeah. to the show actually earlier. Today in history. First yeah. Bert boat goes up to yeah. the canal. There you go. Oh. But uh, I could have left apostrophe off the list. It's an important day. I'm sorry I missed it. <laughs> That's all right. Thank now, you. canal, is it... Uh, when we gave it back to, to Panama or when we started building it or when it was finished or what? When a ship finally made its ah, first okay. passage through the canal. Got it. Okay. Yes. I, uh, do, do you have the year on you there, Jimmy? Because I can look up and see exactly what uh, the thing it was. was 19. I did listen to the show, yeah. but I don't remember the I read year. it about two hours ago. So. Yeah. 19 oh something I, I would imagine. Yeah, pretty early. Yeah. There it is. 1914. The Panama oh, Canal wow. opens the tra traffic with the transit of the cargo ship SS Ancon. So you remember that, Delegate Doyle? <laughs> they did not invite me to the ceremonies. <laughs> no ribbon cutting I'm for you. quite angry about that. <laughs> Speaking of Delegate Doyle, Jim, is there anything you'd like to tell us? Well, you know, I, I've, I've announced candidacy as a Republican for the 94th District. I'm very excited. I actually moved to West Virginia. I transplanted to West Virginia uh, as a, an employee of the state of West Virginia. I have actually lived in three homes that all exist within the 94th district and one of the opportunities that i had was to volunteer at a number of different organizations so i've served in many different capacities throughout the county uh, i completed leadership berkeley in 2015 so again it was another opportunity to learn a lot about uh, what goes on and 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 the areas of need within the area uh, you know berkeley county so what I found is is that there may be an opportunity for me to serve at another level. It feels like this is the right time. Um, certainly appreciate the service of our current delegation. However, I do think that there is a great deal of change that's taken place. We have new delegates from the Panhandle that have done an outstanding job and Delegate Height and Delegate Hornby. I think there's also going to be additional change with uh, Delegate Hardy's transition after this final session from uh, the, del uh, the legislature to a, a potential role within the, the county commission. And I felt like this might be the best time for, for me to, to take a shot at, you know, doing something more for the state. The sitting delegate is Larry Kump, correct? Yes, sir. And have you had any conversations with Delegate Kump about this challenge? I did. I reached out to, de uh, to Delegate Kump um, sometime near the end of the special session. We were unable to connect. He obviously had a very busy schedule, a lot of travel. Um, I wanted to speak with him prior to pre-candidacy. I felt like it was a respect move. We're both Republicans. Uh, obviously, I greatly admire and respect what he's done. I felt like there was an opportunity for, for me, and it just happens to be unfortunate that we reside in the same district. Um, but again, coincidentally, I've always lived in what is the equivalent of today's 94th district. I lived on Woodbury Avenue, which is in the north end of the city of Martinsburg. So it's funny, many of the con uh, the content that you have on the show regarding Lambert Pool and, yes. and Berkeley 2000, that's actually in the 94th district. It, it runs all the way east into uh, all the way past Pennsylvania Avenue. It runs north up to Spurgeon Trucking, then takes a left-hand turn, runs up the south uh, bound exit uh, or southbound side of 81, all the way up to the Potomac River. And then it moves west up Vineyard, down Harlan Springs, Rock Cliff, and then turns east on Edwin Miller. So there's even a large section of where I've worked. I work obviously for Shepherd University at the Martinsburg Center. I've been there for over 10 years. Uh, that entire area is within the district. So when you think about the business and the impact of those businesses on the economy, Quad Graphics, Macy's, FedEx, all of the, the businesses in that section of the, of the district are very important players, I think, in the state of West Virginia. Let's start with you first, former Delegate John Doyle. You have some experience in running for the House. Yeah, so uh, I'm listening to you describe the geography, Jim. Yes, sir. And it sounds like it's pretty much due north of the city and, and, and cutting into the city in the northern part of the city. I'm uh, listening to your description. I'm, I'm trying to envision the map. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so, clearly, if you're go do you know whether or not Delegate Kump is running for re-election? I believe so. He was on the show yesterday, and okay. he seemed very, very positive. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the things that I've done for the community. But, but you are running against him, so clearly 
there, there, there is obviously a reason that you believe what you bring is different than what he brings. So if you could tell us what they, what those things are. A very good question. M my focus is on what I've done in service to the community. I I've worked for, I mean, I have a list of 10 different organizations. I, you know, I've served as chair as the airport authority, which I think is, is well known. Uh, I sit on the board of the Eastern Panhandle Transit Authority the Berkeley County, uh, Martinsburg Berkeley County Chamber of Commerce. I've seen a number of different things. I volunteered with nonprofit organizations, um, West Virginia Promise Advisory Board. Anyway, the point is, is that my career in West Virginia has been within West Virginia. It's been based on service. I've been a member of the Rotary Club and the things that I've done provided me with an opportunity to emulate those values of service above self. Are there any issues where you and Larry have different points of view? No, I don't. I think that I'm not a politician. I and uh, I'm not uh, trying to I categorize. Got, I got to stop you there, Jimmy. Anybody that runs for office is <laughs> ipso could, facto a politician. You, That's you, it. <laughs> you could you could you could categorize me that in the future if I get past the May 14th primary, I uh -uh. suppose. The minute you declare Okay. For office, you are a politician, and there's nothing wrong with being a politician. The country needs politicians, people who are willing to pitch in and say, I'm ready to, to provide service, in, service. In, a, in a given public position if you wish to have me. So, Jim, lesson one, we all learn. You do not argue words with John Doyle. Well, I'm not going to try and overstate <laughs> him, definitely. I, I, I believe that I have learned lots of things about the community through participation in service. You, hope you do belong to a lot of organizations. And I believe that that came from Dr. Shipley and the values that the administration in higher education afforded. I was tasked with opening a branch campus in Martinsburg, and part of that task uh, actually in my PIQ had advised that I should travel 50% of the time. I should get to know everyone. On day two of the job, I met Tina Combs, uh, who was the executive director, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, and um, Rick Wachtel, uh, who was a realtor who helped with identifying the, the location that was eventually selected for the Martinsburg Center. My point being that community service was a foundation for the position and in establishing that what we hope to be a profit center of the university. I, I feel like I was given or afforded that opportunity and that allowed me to spend time in the community doing things to not only elevate the, the, the brand that the university offered, but to interact and find private Part, uh, private um, public partnership to help elevate the mission of the university. And because of those experiences, I believe that that makes me a viable candidate. Yeah. And incidentally, I, I worked with President Shipley and James Vigil and a couple of others to get that center up and running up to the point where it opened. And then my role ended uh, uh, as that happened. And, and I will say, I'm, I'm very sorry to see it go. Uh, I do think it had the opportunity uh, not just to be a profit center, but also to be a uh, strong advertisement for the university in the Martinsburg area. And maybe if it had worked, would have would have increased the college going rate of this whole three county area. Uh, sadly, it, it didn't work. Uh, and and th that's just the way it goes. But uh, yeah, I did want to say that. But I still, uh, Jim, I still and I'm going to let this go now. I do believe if you're going to run against someone for office, you, you have an obligation to the electorate to say, here is how I would do the job differently from the person who has that, uh, that, has that office. Not that you have any personal attacks. No, I think we should all stay away from personal attacks. But to distinguish on, uh, and I'm, I would imagine there are a number of issues where you have at least a slightly different idea of how to deal with the problem than the incumbent Larry Kump does. So I just want to throw that in your head, and I'm going to now let this go. And well, Matt Miller, you take over. <laughs> do you mind if I just – but my, my question, I guess, would be, do you, do you think that boots on the street is a separator? The fact that I worked in the county and that I have – volunteered and worked with a number of those service organizations that ultimately impact the daily operations, the services that are available to the constituents within this district. That doesn't tell me how differently you would do the job than Larry Kump is doing. Well, it really doesn't tell me. We've got between now and May 14th, I'm going to prove that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate sure, that. Sure.
Well, Jim, let me give you a chance then to jump in with maybe some of those differences. Uh, are there perhaps differences in what you might see as priorities in this district that you would like to work on in Charleston that maybe you see Delegate Kump right now not having in that same order? Yeah, I'm, I'm not certain. I, you know, I've not investigated Delegate Kump and, and what it is that he wants to accomplish. I know what I would like to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the West Virginia Rural Water Association, Clean Water Association. I think the clean water is something that's going to be very important for the future. And I think that that obviously plays an important role with infrastructure as well as uh, growth and development and, and how that takes place. I'm a huge proponent of small business. I, I listen to the show whenever I can. And in part, I, I enjoy hearing the way that Delegate Hardy, Delegate Householder have talked about different infrastructure plans, uh, flatline budgets, and the way that they hope to motivate these other organizations to manage how they're going to affect outcomes. So when I think about growth and infrastructure, and I've heard Delegate Doyle talk about karst geography and all, all of these different <laughs> things many times. And, 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 but the fact is, is that when you continue to build, there is going to be stress on the infrastructure and how that water is regulated, the flow. There was a lawsuit a couple of years ago with uh, Maryland about how much water can actually be pulled from the Potomac River. And when you think about what the key growth areas are in, in the area, one of those is within the 94th district, which is in the falling waters. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked with different people about land right opportunities along the Potomac River. People don't, re some people don't realize that the actual border with Maryland is the shallow watermark on the south side of the Potomac River, which prohibits landowners along the Potomac River from having a permanent structure. So when you think about tourism, part of the district runs from Officers Lane down past Amvets all the way into Riverbend. You cannot have a permanent structure along the south bank of the Potomac River. So imagine how that might impact tourism safety for that matter. The fact that you have to have some type of a, a, a movable uh, dock in place along that south border of the Potomac River. So, so th those are just a few things. I, I mean, I could go on and on. And believe me, I'm, I'm more than willing to stay until nine. But when you think about infrastructure, I had a discussion with someone from the state about the traffic light at Beddington Crossroads. Mm -hmm. There's a left turn lane. There's no left turn arrow. <laughs> well, someone from some place determined that it's not necessary. I had a great response from Eddie Gokenauer, Steve Catlett, who are tremendously responsive. I, I, I really believe in the current leadership within the Berkeley County Commission when I pose the question. But when I leave work each day at four o'clock and I pull into Beddington Crossroads and have to turn left, there have been plenty of times where I throw on the right turn signal, you can't turn left. Mm -hmm. And when I talked with the state about it, someone at some point decided through some type of traffic study, I have no idea when, it's not needed. And that's somebody who doesn't live near Beddington. By yes, the way. absolutely. Trying to turn left off off of uh, 11 is next to impossible. And, and why do you think I drive up 11 to, to get home? I live up off Vineyard Road in Falling Waters because I don't want to take 81. Mm -hmm. I'm, there have been plenty of times. One of the reasons I moved to West Virginia is because of the commute and the issues that existed on 81. So, you know, another p potential platform issue could be an enforcement. And, and, and incidentally, you are absolutely right about that left turn lane. Uh, these are decisions made by the State Division of Highways in Charleston. Uh, and uh, the only solution is for legislators to constantly bug them and say, now, listen, I don't care what your study showed. My, the people in my district uh, are, are seriously inconvenienced by not having you Paint that little line on the pavement, and how much is it going to cost you to paint that little line on the that arrow on the pavement? That's uh, to me that is one of the things that legislators ought to be doing, and a whole lot of legislators don't do. Absolutely, and when you look at uh, enforcement, and when you think about, and you know, I've heard great things about Sheriff Harmon and and the impact on eighty one and and the amount of patrols and coverage. But when you do the math, the current population of Berkeley County says that there should be three hundred and three total officers working in Berkeley County. Now that includes. The, the city of Martinsburg it includes those different municipalities when you add up the sum of the total number of officers. But 303 officers for, for, for Berkeley County, based on the population and mm -hmm. FBI statistics on 2.4 per 1,000 people. Well, we're, I'm, I'm fair to, fairly certain we're short on that. <laughs> and, and whose responsibility is to enforce 
the actual agencies and whether or not Sheriff Harmon is in a precarious situation. He reports to his bosses and says, this is the budget. I need this much money. And then there's the back and forth that takes place in any organization when you go to your budget, your bosses and say, I need this much money to fund an adequate force. I met with Chief Gibbons at their open house. Uh, what was that? Two weeks ago, Chief Gibbons said they're down 13 officers. Mm -hmm. They could be down as many as 15 to 18 officers. There is, should be, I think, concern with filling those vacant positions mm -hmm. and what can be done to enforce or, or, or to assist from the state level in recruiting or, or whatever it is, the stopgap. And that's what needs to be investigated. And a large part of it is that... Uh, the, the given the the approach to law enforcement that West Virginia has, which is much more heavily done at the state level than is the case in most other states, we depend much more on state troopers than than people in most states do. The state police right now are seriously understaffed, and whenever they're understaffed, it's the Eastern Panhandle that is really understaffed. That has always been the case, and somehow. That thinking needs to be turned around. Uh, and a whole lot of people have tried to do it. Um, <laughs> Democrats and Republicans over the years. There is this, this psychology in Charleston that they're just out there. <laughs> out on the fringes of the universe. <laughs> Jim Klein is our guest here. Recently has declared for the House of Delegates seat number 94, which uh, Larry Kump, who was on yesterday, is the incumbent for. Go ahead, Matt. I, I was just going to go back to the fact that you brought up that, that you're not a politician until you signed that paperwork to say, I'm going to run for this office, and now you are a politician. What, what is it uh, about not being a politician that you say is an advantage for you? When I when I listened to the, the county commissioner at the time, it was the county council election, and I listened to Brett Rogers talk and, and Steve Catlett and, and a number of those races, they talked about listening. And I think that that's the most important thing. And, and you know, I apologize. I didn't mean to begin the, the interview in an adversarial fashion with Delegate Doyle. But my thought it's is... It's impossible to not. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but, but my thought is, what is the key component to representation? And, and my, my feeling is, I will listen, I will learn, and then I'm going to, tr you know, strive to do a better job. I'm going to compare what I've learned from boots on the ground within the district, what I've seen, and what can be done to, to, to better the, the community. That's what I hope to achieve through service. And if that service requires that I use the P word, then I suppose that's what I'm going to do. But ultimately, that's what it's about. Politics properly practiced includes a large dose of listening. Uh, Jim, in Charleston... We know the advantage with the House of Delegates in Republicans versus Democrats is overwhelming, obviously, on the Republican side. It's nearing 90 to 10 in ratio here. In the Republican Party, however, there are some factions that are forming. And while there, I think there's more than two, the two main ones seem to be those who are very concerned and focused on social issues, social republicanism, and then the pro-business republicanism in which the people who are very pro-business don't necessarily all care as much about the social issues. Describe your form of republicanism and on which side of that camp or those two camps that you would fall. Yeah, I absolutely would think that it has to be in the fiduciary side. I, I believe in the fact that we've, we've got to do things. When I look at small business and the opportunities that exist for them, so when you think about pilot agreements, payment in lieu of taxes, and how the large companies can come in and the, the, the loans and the deferred payments that are available to them, what, what are done if a small business with 50 to 70 employees decides that they want to add another line, a piece of equipment that costs $500,000 that could create 10 to 20 more jobs, is the same opportunity afforded? And, and I have some experience that will tell you, no, those opportunities may not exist to those smaller employers. I've experienced it. I've witnessed it. I know firsthand. I, I absolutely think that there needs to be a focus on uh, new, new small business, whether or not it's new line expansion or expanding some of those loan programs that might exist to those businesses. 
I do not believe in, in, in new taxes. I definitely fill that vein as a Republican. However, I do believe that there could be efficient consolidation. I actually had a comment on my Facebook page where someone talked about the fact that in the state of when, when they lived in Pennsylvania or where, wherever they had lived previously, the, the state ta income taxes were higher. However, they didn't get nickeled and dimed through a, a different process of ambulance and fire and all of these independent fees. I'm still in the learning phase, but when I hear Delegate Hardy and Delegate Householder talk about different things like the 1% sales tax, I, I really wanna learn more about that because if there's a way that you could consolidate some of those fees and pay for them to be able to reduce taxes for our citizens, wouldn't that make sense? So th I think that there's some more investigation that needs to take place. You triggered my memory here when you start talking about the problems of small businesses and maybe doing something that will ha help them create a few jobs here, a few jobs there. What is your position generally on the idea of, of pilot programs, What's what is called payment in lieu of taxes? which is usually a huge chunk of money given to an out-of-state company to bring them in to maybe create a couple of hundred jobs. Right. So, you know, when you look at Forum Energy and, and the, the, the criticism that came as a result of that decision, it's a, it's a major investment. It was that $130, $150 million mm -hmm. investment that, that the, the criticism of the legislature was that Elon Musk wouldn't put a penny into it. So, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I need to look into that. Mm -hmm. I need to dig much deeper. When we hear about things like Delegate Householder talking yesterday about the the potential drop in revenue or the flat line type situation where the surplus may be dropping a little bit, is that a result? And maybe you know this, Delegate uh, Doyle. Is the payment in lieu of taxes, some of those from the large business that have come in, because of that deferred payment, is that why we're seeing a drop in some of the surpluses? Well, no, uh, that would be a drop why uh, local governments, those payment in lieu of taxes are usually on property taxes, which is money that goes to local schools and local governments. Those are the areas that are seeing less money uh, than they would have gotten uh, as a result of those things. Um, the The... Uh, drop in the, the surplus, which and, and, and in the budget going forward, is simply a result of that 20% cut in the income tax. I mean, when, when you cut taxes, you are going to have less money. And there's always this argument between uh, people who think that cutting taxes like that will uh, very shortly or at least eventually dry, dry, spur up the economy so eventually you get that much money back. Right. And those of us uh, and who tend to call ourselves Democrats, who tend to think, yes, you'll get some of it back, but you never get all of it back. So whenever you're going to do a tax cut, you have to factor in that you're going to have somewhat less money to work with. And how are you going to do it? Jim, about a minute left. Final word is yours. You know, I appreciate the consideration and thank you for the time. I actually took some leave from work to be able to come into the office today or to come into the station. So, you know, I very much appreciate that. Uh, KleinWorks94 at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook. KleinWorksWV94 at Facebook. If you'd like to look me up and learn more about the platform, uh, you know, I really appreciate the time. Uh, I believe that I will work hard, listen, and respond to each of the constituents of the 94th. So thank you. Jim, thank you and uh, congratulations to you on taking the leap. And best of luck yeah. to you. Thank you. Thank you all.